good afternoon ladies and gentlemen thank you many of you came here uh, four at four and some of you even earlier than four so we'll get started now uh, request professor mehr prasad to uh, professor mehr prasad to welcome the uh, gathering here professor mehr prasad is head of department uh, civil engineering iit madras First, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Matthews because he's going to preside over the function. So he should uh, come and occupy the space. And I request the. I request Michelle Danino, uh, today's speaker, star speaker, uh, to be on the dais. Uh, I'll just quickly go through uh, some exciting things that we have been doing in the last one year, uh, which we started because we wanted to have um, uh, World Heritage Days on April 18th. So last year we started the first uh, annual lecture, which we wanted to have um, every year. So uh, uh, we started with Professor Narayan Iyengar and uh, uh, Mr. Mutaya, who is uh, presided over the function. So we wanted to carry on uh, every year. So this year we uh, we have pleasure of having uh, Michelle Danino and also Professor Matthews, who is one of our mentors, who has started this particular area in our IIT Madras. Uh, this year, from the last um, April 18th to this year, last one year, uh, we have one national center for uh, um, safety of heritage structures. This is a MHRD supported program, and we have around. Uh, 12.5 crores allocated for five years. Uh, so uh, this uh, actually based on uh, the work done by our IIT, uh, to, to which Professor Matthews has contributed to a large extent. And we are also able to show some group activity with large number of faculty workers motivated by Professor Matthews. We did work in uh, Cambodia, and that got notice. And also some uh, Kutub Minar and uh, uh, Uttar Merur, there's so many uh, projects uh, that we are involved. Uh, so that got us uh, some recognition. And then uh, uh, after uh, Dr. Arun Menon joined, we have all the more interest to go in for this uh, conservation engineering and strategies. So this center is one of the things that have come about, which uh, Professor Matthews provided the seed. And uh, unfortunately, he's not with our center right now, but we're always going to give him a role and ensure that uh, he works with us. The, uh, the important point of this National uh, Center for uh, Safety of uh, Heritage Structures is we have an international advisory body um, uh, in which uh, uh, we have people who really are researching and other, uh, other uh, places, especially in Europe, Professor Paulo Lorenzo, Narayan Iyengar, and from our architect, a uh, very interesting group is there in this uh, advisory board, which will give uh, in sort of a direction uh, to that one. And that meeting also has started uh, in January of this year. So I think initially, that is also going to be chaired by uh, uh, our director. So it is, uh, institute is also showing a lot of interest in this particular aspect. And uh, not only that one, uh, the advisory board will be meeting more often initially so that there is a direction that is going to be set. In fact, almost every six months we are advised to have initially, later maybe a per year when uh, we are ready for the things there. So a uh, lot more things were happening simultaneously. I think uh, Michelle Danino knows uh, that we had a couple of years ago, almost uh, two and a half years ago, we had a meeting to start some activity in this particular area as a group activity with, uh, um, with archaeological uh, uh, groups, different groups that are working in this particular area. So uh, we are not fully formalized, but uh, now we are going one by one. So we signed an MOU with ASI. Uh, just uh, we have sent an MOU and it will be cleared uh, uh, this one. They also had given many projects to us already. Um, one of the projects that we'll be working on is the Kedarnath Temple rehabilitation because last year, last June, uh, there was a flood problem there. 
So I think uh, this summer will be our team will be there fully uh, uh, to uh, to give the technical support to ASI. That is one mandate uh, that uh, we got already. Uh, and then there's other thing which is important. Um, we are working with the HRC uh, Tamil Nadu to have a very specific course and uh, uh, on conservation and restoration of uh, heritage structures. It's a certificate course, very focused, where we'll provide uh, uh, the resources, uh, um, uh, the manpower required for training their engineers. So that is uh, one more important aspect of this particular center that is going to be there. And um, uh, when it comes to the research uh, things, we wanted to work uh, in focused way. I think Dr. Manu Santanam is here on lime motors. So we are going to start off with one uh, um, sort of a workshop on lime motors, specifically, historically, what has been happening and how to go about in doing uh, this uh, traditional practices and, and uh, characterization and scientific studies on the lime motors. Um, it's going to be a three-day workshop. It is planned in July. So uh, yeah, that is one thing that is going to be there. And also, we are going to upgrade our curriculum to bring in many courses uh, uh, basis on the basis of the advisory board that we have for this particular thing to start activities full-time on this particular aspect, a very important aspect. Um, I'll not stand before you uh, before introducing. I think uh, there's a formal introduction of uh, uh, our both the guests here. Uh, uh, one is not our guest really. Uh, Professor Matthews is one of us uh, in a way, uh, even though he left us. So uh, the thing is, he's going to preside and he'll run the show for today's thing. So uh, I would request Arun to uh, give a little more details on that one. There is already a website based on that one. There's one question that is asked. How did that uh, logo come about? I think Arun would explain that one. So, Thank you, Professor Prasad. Uh, very briefly uh, about the center. Um, the website of the center is www.ncshs.org. So you won't get it wrong. It's NCSHS, as it is in the, uh, as you see here, .org organization. And um, details are um, of the projects that we're involved in and the team the National Advisory Board, Implementation Council, uh, all the details are on the website. Uh, I would like to uh, formally introduce uh, the uh, professor presiding over this uh, program, uh, which is the second annual lecture on the safety and conservation of heritage structures. Uh, professor Ms. Matthews um, was professor of civil engineering at IIT Madras. Uh, he retired in 2013. He's really been the uh, fountainhead of um, IIT Madras's uh, civil engineering department's uh, foray into uh, the area of heritage conservation. Uh, Professor Matthews uh, graduated from IIT Madras uh, with his B.Tech degree and did his M.S. and Ph.D. at IIT Madras and has been a faculty member at the civil engineering department for more than 40 years. So uh, we had the uh, privilege, I had the privilege of being a student of Professor Matthews here at IIT Madras when I did my master's. And um, uh, the work that uh, I was able to do with him in terms of um, the earthquake damaged monuments uh, at, uh, in the state of Gujarat after the Bhuj earthquake uh, was really the um, initiation uh, for me into this particular area. Uh, uh, I think beyond, with, beyond that point in time, uh, the civil engineering department has been constantly engaging um, until recently, uh, in a number of projects for the Archaeological Survey of India, for the um, State Archaeology Department, uh, the uh, HRC, the Hindu um, Religious and Charitable Endowments, the Endowments Department of Andhra Pradesh, and so on. Um, but it was it, in 2013 that uh, we intended to take it forward in a formal manner. Um, and the platform that was available was provided by the Ministry of uh, Human Resource Development which was looking at, a, at an interface between technology and culture. And um, in that uh, particular forum, IIT Madras's proposal to have a center looking at safety aspects of heritage structures was uh, the first uh, proposal that was accepted and funded immediately. So we have um, the complete backing of the uh, ministry and the institute uh, on this uh, 
on this uh, subject and on uh, this endeavor. So the first annual lecture which um, happened before the initiation of the center and the second annual lecture which today is happening after the initiation of the center are uh, very important milestones for us. And uh, it, it's, it's just perfect that Professor Matthews is here to preside over the uh, second annual lecture. And uh, I will introduce the speaker, uh, Professor Michelle Benino, immediately after the um, president's presidential comments. Um, and the topic of today's lecture is something absolutely exciting, uh, looking at the ancient Indian wisdom in uh, sites that are in our country today. Thank you, Professor Matthews. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, Chief guest of the day, Dr. Michelle Danino, head of the department, Professor Maya Prasad, Dr. Arun, many of my uh, colleagues, many of my students whom I lost, uh, taught uh, just uh, last, uh, last year, and my old friends, my very old student, Mr. Mohan, who is sitting there, one of my first batch. Actually, one of the first batch is Dr. Devdas Menon, who is sitting there. So it's uh, very nice to be back here in this hall. Uh, after one year, but more importantly, I feel nostalgic, but the first time I sat in this hall, it was in 1964, as a B.Tech student, as a frightened chicken, with the director, Sengupta, sitting here, every word sending a fear into our hearts. That was way back in July 1964, perhaps be before most of you have born. Huh? Okay, it's very nice. Uh, I would like to give a few introductory remarks uh, before we have the main talk on Harappan expertise in civil engineering. Since this center is devoted to safety of heritage structures, I have a burden in my heart which I'd like to share. By the way, are there any press reporters here? Sir, are you going to report everything? Because if the press reporters are not here, I'd like to talk in a different way. Yeah? How many of you are here? Please put up your hand. Oh, great. four. You also. You are a press reporter. Four people. So I have to be a little guarded. Huh? Okay. So this uh, picture shows some of the world heritage uh, monuments in our country, and our country has one of the largest number of uh, monuments important monuments in the whole world. And many of them are getting destroyed due to natural calamities and also uh, due to neglect. And there's not much economic uh, force to drive for their survival. Now, this is a map which shows the most of the monuments in our country are located in zone 5, 4, and 3, which is very sad. So this is the most seismically active zones in our country, and many of them are located there. And if you consider monuments of our country, the South Indian monuments are made of granite. And granite is one of the materials, Shunji material, which can last a thousand years. Whereas most of the North Indian monuments are made out of sandstone, which is sedimentary and doesn't last that long. They're lighter, they're not as strong, their compressive strength much less, and they can be easily destroyed. And uh, myself and Arun, as uh, Dr. Arun mentioned, we were there in Buj. We saw many of the monuments coming down like skittles uh, in that earthquake. So here we find many of the important monuments in these zones, which is uh, zone 4. Uh, in zone 5, luckily, uh, there is not any world heritage monument. And here you find the, according to USGS, most of the earthquakes with their intensity, uh, which have occurred in the last a uh, couple of uh, decades being plotted here and that is the worry, uh, worrying point, the Himalayan arc. Now this is the list of earthquakes right up to March 14, which has happened. The 
These are low intensities which has happened from 12 to 14. It's 5.2, 3.5, but as you go back, you find that the intensity increases. I marked in 9, 7.7, .7. in 5, Kashmir, 7.6. And if you go down further, uh, 4, 9.3, then here, 8.1, 7.1. And it's quite a few, uh, sometimes since we had an earthquake of very high intensity. The Buj is 7.7. .7. So, what is of real concern is if you look at the map of Delhi, which is sitting very close to the Indian plate, the Eurasian plate, you see the settlements here. I just took one screenshot. There are several screenshots like this. This is an urban settlement, mostly non engineered structures, mostly uh, masonry, not engineered. And many of them made out of mud mortar, one or two stories, absolutely no strength at all, even for static loading. When the east is a little shake, and last month there were three uh, earthquakes between one o'clock and four o'clock reported in Delhi. But luckily the intensity is around four or four point two, so no major damage occurred. And in this zone, if you see into the Google satellite map, each of this are where this Kutub Minar and such monuments sitting on all these places. They cannot withstand any severe moment because this is just sandstone sitting on sandstone with a small peg, wooden peg connecting them without any ability to transfer any tensile stress. Tensile stresses. So this is the Sikkim earthquake, the major one occurred in 2011. The, the volume. Hey everybody, Dutch Sense here. It is 9.18 a.m. Central Time on Sunday, September 18th, 2011. 2011. And there was a 6.8 earthquake in India today, and that was at Sikkim, India. Let me pull the stats on this. It was at 12.9 miles deep. Again today at uh, 1200 universal time and 6.8 magnitude. Let's go ahead and zoom it in. And it's going right along the Himalayas there. It's an area that we've uh, been watching for additional large earthquakes. Indochina right there. All right, so hang in there, folks. Much love, be safe, and definitely have your earthquake preparedness plans ready. So his caution is have your earthquake plans ready. And he says where much larger uh, earthquakes are going to be expected. And that's the Himalayan arc. Next one. So this is the consequence of that uh, Sikkim earthquake, a collage. What happened there? You can look at some of these monasteries which have been damaged. Now, uh, number nine, Jenpat should ring a bell in uh, many people's mind. So, uh, since our friends from the press side, yeah, I won't go further on that. Uh, so, this is what will happen. This is a building which is called LBZ, building complex, about 85 buildings built by Britishers in the 20s and mostly occupied the very VIPs and VVIPs of a country. Now, if there's an earthquake above 7, this is what will happen to these buildings. We brought a, a masonry block cut out from the building here, from this 9 Janpat, and tested, and the strength was extremely uh, low. And in some places, the mortar was mud. And very high, very thick roof with waterproofing, laid rev uh, several times, so it's top heavy. And uh, this is the situation when uh, if an earthquake happens. So we worked on it for one to one and a half years. We did uh, modeling and we did a retrofitting scheme of introducing ferrocement uh, bands which will be concealed with uh, CFRP and uh, steel. And we showed by calculation that in the event that it, it is uh, retrofitted like this, it will be damaged, but it will not collapse. That means it will be damaged, but people will not die. Then uh, about 10 days back, 
I phoned up the engineer and asked whether anything has been done. We did for four such buildings out of 86. And that engineer said, uh, uh, we didn't do anything. It is uh, collecting dust, the report. Then uh, he said, I, I asked, what should I do? Uh, does your chief engineer know about this? So I'm, again, I'm worried about huh? <laughs> Okay. So he said that it's better that you call up the chief engineer and tell that uh, it is very dangerous. It's better that you do something. So in the essence, what I'm saying is all the non-engineered and uh, these load-bearing structures in Delhi, in large settlements, are in great danger of the uh, earthquake. Right now, this earthquake is due, and um, you see, this is the Indian plate which millions of years ago got detached from Australia and come and hit the Eurasian plate. And this is the fault plane here. And this, the picture, those are not familiar with uh, this uh, plate tectonics. It shows here, this is the Eurasian plate here. This is a uh, Indian, two and a half billion year old Indian plate, which migrated all the way from Australia, came and hit this plate. And uh, the Himalaya rose up. The proof for that is you can collect seashells from Himalayas. And he has a reference point, a point which was here, went up here, and this is one of the tallest, the highest mountains in the whole world. So this is, uh, this is where, so today's uh, talk, I want to just, if you forget everything else, just I want you to focus on this diagram. On this Himalayan arc, you find that these blotches here, which where major earthquakes have happened in 19, uh, 1883, 1934, 1950, and the stress there has been released. But if you look at these points here, these points here, these points here, these points here, this point here, this point here, and this point here, this is the expected slip. That means the Indian plate, which when there's an earthquake, when this plate ruptures at this point, the Indian plate will slide under the Eurasian plate when there is a and then the magnitude of the earthquake can be between 7.8 and 8.2. Remember, Buj was only 7.7. .7. So the expected earthquake, as we are doing this talk, that this earthquake can happen, and TV can announce, or it can happen at any time in the future. Because it is a probabilistic, probabilistic event. We cannot tell exactly when it will happen. But all indicators are there that the stresses are phenomenal along this arc. So what does this figure tell us? A great earthquake of magnitude 7.9 to 8.2 is over the Himalayan arc. One. So my conclusions are there is urgent need to create awareness among people from ordinary citizens to top policy makers about the impending danger. Second is, we need not do a complete retrofitting to all structures, but minimal intervention to avoid large scale destruction of life and property. What do I mean by this? We have a soft story. At least we can strengthen the soft story part, the ground floor column, so the whole building does not collapse. But some beams and slabs inside, they collapse and some damages occur, it's okay. But we can prevent this 12-story building, 18-story buildings from toppling over as it happened in Butch. So that the cost is less. Doing the entire building, the cost will be phenomenal. So this one. And the last point is, while we know all this, we should mobilize people movement to achieve this awareness and minimal intervention. So I submit this for your consideration. I hope you will take this message over to people who have concern on this impending danger lying along the Himalayan arc. And this, uh, this one is done by a famous uh, uh, author, Bill Han. He is a seismologist who has been banned from entering into uh, country for certain other reasons. So maybe you can read up about uh, Bill Han, but he has done a lot of uh, tremendous work. And this is a paper published in Nature. The reference is Nature. It's not an ordinary journal. This is from Nature. So this is what I want to say as a preface to 
safety. Now, uh, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, Dr. Arun and uh, Dr. Raghu Kant for helping with this presentation. And coming back to today's uh, talk, we are going to uh, listen to Professor Danino on the Harappan expertise in civil engineering. Harappa and Mohenjad Daro, every school child in our country knows about this. And we as Indians, for 5,000 years ago, uh, knew a lot of the civil engineering bonds and how to make these uh, intricate civil engineering structures. And whenever uh, I'm abroad, uh, people respect uh, Indians because of our achievement in these areas even 5,000 years ago. So, Professor Denino, I heard him earlier also. He's uh, done a lot of uh, research work on this area and he's continuing to do research in this area. Gandhinagar is setting up an archaeological uh, science, archaeological science center. Center is exploring these things in much greater detail. So, uh, I'm, uh, I welcome him and uh, looking forward to hearing the exciting things of our ancient. Uh, a grand, uh, great uh, grandfathers. My grand, uh, great grandfather, I do not know whether you can also claim him to be your great grandfather. Huh? Sure, our combined <laughs> great grandfather, uh, what they did in the civil engineering. And another issue on civil engineering, civil engineering doesn't change that fast. Whereas computer science, by you do four years, the first two years knowledge is already outdated. They have to keep running, but civil engineering, we can go a little slow. I don't know whether it's true, whether HOD will agree with me with current day civil engineering. Okay, with these few words, I invite uh, Professor Danino. I think uh, you'll be introduced. In France in 1956, has been living in India since 1977. A student of Indian civilization, he has authored papers and books in French and English. Recent titles include The Lost River on the Trail of Saraswati a multidisciplinary study of the Vedic uh, Saraswati River. Other books include An Indian Culture and India's Future, The Dawn of Indian Civilization and the Elusive Aryans is a, a title which is uh, forthcoming. Uh, Professor Danino has lectured at many cultural and higher educational institutions across India and he's currently at IIT Gandhinagar as a guest professor where he's assisting setting up of an archaeological sciences center. Professor Danino has been uh, instrumental in uh, us working towards setting up the uh, center. On 5th September 2012, we had a uh, preliminary meeting at IIT Madras where uh, Professor Danino was present uh, with members from the Archaeological Survey of India and uh, the Department of Civil Engineering IIT Madras. And that really uh, laid the foundation for uh, taking the, this endeavor forward at IIT Madras. So, Professor uh, Danino, uh, your talk on Harap and expertise in civil engineering. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Arun, um, Professor Meher Passal, Professor Matthews. Uh, it's an honor to have um, this uh, second uh, memorial lecture uh, in this uh, pioneering center and um, to have it presided over by Professor Matthews. Uh, whom I've been lucky to know for a few years. Uh, I think this center has a bright future ahead and lots of very important projects uh, which uh, are the need of the day because uh, Indian archaeology has suffered from a lot of um, ex a lack of expertise in the way it has handled uh, problems of heritage conservation in particular. So <clears throat> whatever Professor Matthews has shown us before is highly relevant. And uh, I, I hope to show uh, how uh, Harappans dealt with not exactly, of course, similar problems, though I will uh, bring the problem of earthquakes very briefly in, on one or two occasions, uh, but how Harappans face problems of civil engineering in the establishments of their cities. So uh, I'm going to cover a very wide field, of course, uh, somewhat superficially, and um, <clears throat> trying to show how in every field they were pioneers and um, sometimes, in fact, they have found solutions which we could still sometimes perhaps learn from. Um, let me start with 
a very brief overview of the Harappan civilization, also called Indus civilization. Indus Valley civilization is regarded as an obsolete term for an obvious reason that, uh, as you can see, <clears throat> it is the entire northwest of India with even one side uh, above this map in northern Afghanistan and sites uh, all the way to Maharashtra and western Uttar Pradesh. Uh, so we cannot really speak of Indus Valley anymore. Uh, it is also called in the Sarasvati civilization because, in fact, most of the sites are located along the uh, now dry bed <coughs> of a river called the uh, Ghagar uh, River in India and Hakra in Pakistan, uh, as this is the international border, as you can see. And we have here the highest concentration of Harappan sites. Uh, curiously, uh, it was actually not really in the Indus, though there, there, there's a good number of them. Um, I'll show you the figures in a moment, but first of all, uh, let us keep in mind that this area is something like one million square kilometers. It's huge. It's much vaster than ancient Egypt or ancient Mesopotamia, which are contemporary civilizations. These three civilizations are Bronze Age civilizations. We are in the third millennium BC. These are the dates for the, strictly speaking, urban phase of the Indus civilization. Of course, there are long developments earlier and some later, but I'm not going to talk about that because uh, that would be too, too long. And um, so this is already a, a huge question mark. How does a civilization manage such a colossal area in ancient times where most of communications are limited to the bullock cart or to uh, uh, boats on the rivers? So uh, this, uh, this is something that uh, archaeologists are yet debating. But let us keep in mind, we are in the third millennium BC, broadly speaking, and we are going to have a look at cities like Mohenjo-daro, which is here, of course, famous, uh, uh, the most famous uh, in Sindh. Harappa, which was excavated from 1921 onward, Mohenjo-daro just the next year. And uh, uh, we will also see a number of cities in India, like uh, Kalibangan, uh, which is in northern Rajasthan, uh, Dholavira is a very important city in the run of Kutch. Lothal is an important little town uh, in, uh, in Gujarat. Uh, there are many more sites which are being explored. Uh, uh, not too many in Pakistan, unfortunately, but in India, uh, Rakighari uh, in Haryana is possibly the largest site located within India. Its exact uh, area is still being debated, but it runs into possibly more than 200 hectares, whereas Dholavira is around 100 hectares. Uh, there are many more sites, especially in Haryana, which have been explored of late. So <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, in fact, we don't yet know the final word about the Harappan, uh, the distribution of Harappan sites. This is a temporary table which I compiled from various sources, uh, which shows you, you can just concentrate on the mature phase, because we are not concerned with the, uh, with the earlier or later phase right now. And you can see that the Sarasvati Basin has uh, one of the largest uh, chunks of Harappan sites, followed closely by Gujarat. Uh, but if we, of course, uh, include the entire Indus region, uh, together with sites in Baluchistan, uh, we get to a little more than 400. So uh, this is the, a temporary figure. In fact, it should be something like 1,200 sites today if we include all the latest discoveries uh, in Haryana and Punjab, which actually almost every month you have new Harappan sites being discovered. Now, keep in mind that discovered simply means identified. It doesn't mean that they are excavated. In fact, not more than 10% of these sites have been excavated. 90% are totally untouched. They are identified simply by uh, collecting uh, material on the surface. And <clears throat> even those 10%, most of them have been very, very scantily excavated, just a couple of trenches here or there to get the vertical stratigraphy uh, and therefore the chronology of the site. So uh, we must understand that uh, our uh, uh, grasp of this civilization is still in its preliminary phases. And there's a lot to be discovered and sometimes uh, a new ex uh, site can throw up totally unexpected um, uh, aspects of the civilization. Initially, it was thought that Mohenjo-daro might have been a central capital, something like, you know, they were, like it were, uh, the, the, uh, the 
early archaeologists were talking of the Harappan Empire. And then they figured a kind of emperor sitting somewhere in Mohenjo-daro. But this has been totally, um, I won't say rejected, but um, uh, modified by so many uh, uh, important cities outside uh, Sindh. And in fact, this is one of the current thoughts, lines of thought among archaeologists. This is from uh, the late Gregory Possel, who uh, uh, sees more regional developments with each region having a certain stamp of its own, especially in terms of pottery and uh, develop uh, certain types of crafts. Uh, but nevertheless, as we will see, there is at the same time a, a unity, a certain amount of standardization running across all these regions. So we don't know really how the government, if you like, was functioning, what kind of uh, overall administration was at work. Uh, but we can speak of a kind of confederation uh, with some assurance. Uh, don't forget also that this uh, Indus civilization was not living in isolation. It was in touch with many other Bronze Age civilizations, uh, especially those of the, the entire region around the Persian or Arabian Gulf. You see here Magan, which corresponds more or less to Oman, Dilmun uh, to Kuwait, and uh, a, a few other Emirates. Uh, Mesopotamia, of course, and uh, we know that Harappan goods have been found and seals have been found in Mesopotamia. Elam, which was part of Iran, Iran itself, and then the entire uh, reg southern region of Central Asia. So it's a huge sphere of interaction, as it is called. Uh, these uh, civilizations were trading fairly peacefully together, exchanging a lot of uh, uh, goods and also cultural inputs, and yet the striking phenomenon is that all of them kept a stamp of its own. They, they, they did not merge. They, rem they kept their specific individuality, and uh, including the, the Harappan civilization. Uh, one of its peculiar features was that the early archaeologists who excavated there were a little disappointed. You see, they were expecting uh, very spectacular finds, the kind of which had you know, been found in, in ancient Egypt or ancient Mesopotamia. So, uh, of course, there were no pyramids that was already understood, but maybe some glorious royal tombs with lots of treasures and gold and stuff like that. But then they found, as Mortimer Wheeler says, you know, miles and miles of monotonous brickwork uh, with, with almost nothing, almost no art piece, uh, almost uh, no, um, uh, uh, you know, hoard of gold or, or jewelry, etc. So it was a little bit of a disappointment, and <clears throat> uh, it took them some time to understand that the genius of this particular civilization was elsewhere. And in fact, uh, th that's what we're going to discover uh, in this talk. So uh, this is from Mohenjo-daro. We will revisit uh, this slide a little later. Let me start with the, uh, the most striking, of course, most visible, conspicuous feature of uh, uh, the uh, Harappan expertise in civil engineering, and that is the urban development. And this is where uh, it perhaps scored over its uh, contemporary civilizations. Actually, we are not, of course, trying to compare and you know, decide which one was ahead of the others. One that depended on uh, every uh, particular aspect of their developments. So we're not, we, we're not in comparisons. But uh, one thing which is immediately striking is that if you look at a plan like this, this is the plan for the Acropolis, that is to say, upper city of Mohenjo-daro, which sits on a mound, as you can see. And this mound is actually an artificial platform made of mud bricks of something like seven meters in height, uh, which was meant to somewhat insulate it from the uh, regular floods of the nearby Indus River. Uh, which in those days were, of course, much more powerful in amplitude than they are today because of the number of dams which have been constructed of the river. And uh, so uh, 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 you have a huge, millions and millions of mud bricks have been uh, uh, brought here, and then this was built over. And uh, you can see immediately that there is an intention. There is a, a plan. Uh, some people, we will never know who, uh, call them architects, call them civil engineers, sat down and decided that they wanted to build a city exactly like this. And like this means streets, 
uh, uh, perfectly at 90 degrees angles, um, aligned in addition to the cardinal directions. This is north, south, east, west, uh, very precisely. And, and uh, monumental structures, huge buildings, strangely, uh, whose purpose most of the time is still uncertain. Uh, the reason is that, uh, in, for instance, in ancient Egypt, uh, you can almost, in, in every city, not quite, but uh, very often, you can immediately point to the, 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 the palace. You see the place where the pharaoh lived. It kind of stands out. It was meant to stand out. There was an architectural message given that, you know, this is where the ruler lives. There is no such architectural message ever given in the Harappan world. And you never know, actually, where the ruler might have been uh, really living. Somewhere here, because this is the upper part of the city, the lower part is a huge area. We'll see only a small bit of it uh, to, the, uh, to the east of the Acropolis. And uh, you see here a building which we'll re revisit. This is the Great Bath. This is an enormous building of uh, nearly 23 meters in uh, width and 69 in uh, length. Uh, perhaps it was uh, uh, so, uh, where the ruler lived, but we don't really know because it's just a series of endless uh, layout of rooms. Uh, there are pillared halls here. I mean, in fact, I could show you the, the plan more clearly with the, these indications. This is a pillared hall. Uh, there are, uh, th this is the great bath, and this is the so-called college. All these terms are a little bit arbitrary, including the term of granary, which many of you would have learned uh, in, in your school textbooks. And uh, this colossal building with huge platforms, uh, in fact, today, well, nobody really knows anymore what it was uh, used for. Uh, there's no direct evidence that it was ever used to store grain, because no, no remains of grains have been found there. Uh, this is the uh, closer view of the granary with all its platform. Uh, the safest uh, label that some archaeologists today propose is that of a warehouse. But to store what is, is again, a mystery. Um, uh, it was quite enormous in size. Uh, you can see the, the, the complex of the great bark next to it. And uh, there were all kinds of structures there to uh, lower goods to, to platforms of different levels. But in the, at the end of the day, what was being stored remains a little uh, uncertain. These are some of these platforms here, uh, where, which belong actually, strictly speaking, to different uh, periods. They were not all of the same epoch. And uh, there are some remains of uh, sockets, of uh, timber sockets, showing that there must have been a huge superstructure made of wooden beams over which some kind of a roof would have been laid. Uh, so this was certainly for storing something, but whether it was uh, grain is not quite proven yet. Uh, the lower city of Mohenjo-daro, to the east of the Acropolis we have just seen, is marked by a number of streets also, um, uh, including this wide, nine meter wide street. But then it is a more complex layout, a little more, this is just a small part of the lower town. Uh, we can see that the planning suddenly seems a little less neat than it did in the Acropolis. Nevertheless, we still have, this is the street we were looking at in the previous photo, we still have a broad north, south, and east-west alignment of streets. You can see that there is still a desire to keep uh, a, an alignment with the cardinal directions. And there are what seems to be like big blocks between those streets. There are blocks which have been identified and these blocks actually have individual platforms of mud bricks. They are not just constructed in a haphazard way. And uh, these platforms have uh, specific levels which will allow the, the whole sanitation system, which we'll see a little later, to work uh, fairly smoothly. So there is a considerable amount of planning which uh, took place. And <clears throat> this is, um, in fact, more so than uh, in cities of ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia, where usually only the, the area which uh, was immediately around the pharaoh's palace or the king's uh, palace in, in Mesopotamia uh, had some form of planning. But otherwise, the rest of the city at large uh, resembled more you know, what uh, our modern Indian cities may look like. 
And uh, you know, if you look at most Indian cities today, uh, they, they, they're just not planned. They're just villages that kept growing and growing in an organic fashion. And uh, uh, you cannot make out a, a, a perfect geometric grid as we could do in the Acropolis and to some extent here also. Um, this is a view of Harappa, uh, where uh, Harappa is a, is a very uh, complicated story because uh, it was actually mined for its bricks in the 1850s, long before it was identified, I mean long before it was understood to belong to a Bronze Age civilization. Uh, its bricks were so uh, uh, attractive, they seem to have modern, I'm coming back to the bricks a little later, uh, they seem to have modern proportions, and the British railway engineers who were laying a, a railway line between Multan and Lahore uh, needed something, you know, for their ballast. And uh, in Punjab and Sindh, you have almost no sources of stone. So they found this uh, uh, big uh, mound, which, was, uh, which had millions of uh, bricks, and they started mining them. They, in fact, laid a small railway line to evacuate the uh, bricks from Harappa towards the railway line which they were constructing. And as a result, of course, they destroyed much of the city. So there are big gaps uh, in the, the understanding of the total layout of Harappa. Nevertheless, uh, it's been under excavation by many archaeologists, including successive uh, teams of American archaeologists, uh, who have uh, brought out a huge amount of data. And uh, uh, what we can see here is that it's not two regions as at Mohenjo-daro, but a number of mounds. There are at least uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, which have been identified. There might even be uh, some more further away. And uh, these mounds had their own uh, separate uh, fortified enclosures. <clears throat> so the exact relationship between them is not yet fully understood. Uh, they had their own separate gateways also. In fact, I think that uh, I, I will have one uh, uh, picture of a gateway to show you later. But this is a close-up of the so-called AB mound here, where you can see the type of fortification uh, enclosing the mound. And this is facing, uh, in a way which we will find again very shortly in India, this faces the riverbed. And this is what is known as a recessed entrance, uh, which allows, you know, it's a, it's a narrowed entrance into the, the fortified area, which allows control, basically control of, um, uh, for possibly for defensive purposes, but mostly for the movement of trade goods. Trade goods go, coming into or out of the city. Uh, it is with such uh, uh, narrowed uh, entrances that you can easily control what's going on. But then the question that people have asked is, is why have fortified cities at all? And because, once again, uh, uh, in, in many parts of the world, uh, cities have happened without any fortifications. So why should Harappans be so keen on fortifying their cities? Uh, many theories have been put forward. One, of course, is that they were used as defenses. And this is how, in fact, Mortimer Wheeler, who first identified those fortifications here, uh, as soon as he joined uh, the archaeological survey as uh, its uh, director general in the 1940s, I think 1946, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or 45 perhaps, uh, he, uh, he declared them to be defenses. And then he conjured up a whole warlike context. Um, uh, as you can see here, this was called a citadel, not an acropolis, which is a new, more neutral term. Uh, the point is that perhaps some of the Harappan fortifications were uh, intended to protect against raids by local populations or distant uh, uh, <clears throat> wild tribal populations, possibly. But the fact is that there has never been any evidence of this at any Harappan site. There's no evidence of man-made destruction anywhere, no evidence of warfare of any, uh, of any sort. It may yet uh, come up in future excavations, but as of now, uh, Harappan civilization seems to be strangely unwarlike. Uh, there are very few weapons. There are no specific weapons of war, no depictions of scenes of warfare the way you have, you know, all of uh, uh, Egyptian uh, 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 temples and palaces, etc. 
So uh, this uh, purpose is actually being questioned by a number of archaeologists. Protection from floods in certain situations where you have rivers like this one. This is the Ravi River. I forgot to mention the Ravi is a tributary, of course, of the Indus. Or at Mohanjo-Daro, of course, the Indus itself. Some of these rivers may go into spate, and uh, uh, the fortifications could have, in some of these locations, uh, protected against the floods. Control of trade, I already mentioned. And then more abstract, perhaps, but yet real purposes, like the need to define the urban space, the need to, to declare that this is the city, you see, and uh, uh, this is our urban space. Or even further, as a symbol of authority. Uh, you see, we, we don't have any symbol of authority otherwise in the Harappan world. The way we have uh, the Pharaoh's palace again, or the great pyramids, and so on, which, which are really symbols uh, that stand for the greatness of the Pharaoh. Uh, perhaps this is the way by which the Harappan rulers were expecting to be, uh, uh, you see, understood, recognized, acknowledged. So these are some of the uh, discussions going on. This is in Harappa, a, an enormous building. We'll see its proportions later on. Actually, it's 50 meters in length and 40 in width. So uh, uh, the largest Harappan building to date, uh, all of these platforms are something like 15 meters long. And yet, and yet we can't uh, pinpoint its purpose with any degree of certainty. It, again, it was declared to be a granary. But uh, recent careful analysis of the soil have shown absolutely no evidence of storage of grain at any time. So <clears throat> it's a mystery. Was it a kind of community hall or assembly hall? Uh, well, any, any hypothesis is as good as another. Um, this is one of the gateways into Harappa. The worker at the top gives you the scale, so very narrow, as you can see. And it clearly, it's, it, it tells us that there's a desire to control, to exert some control. And very often, in some of these gateways at the entrance, uh, some of the Harappan weights, which I'll show you in a later slide, have been shown. And those weights were used in the trade. They were, they, so we can picture some of the you know, guards, sentinels, having a, a, a scale and uh, weighing goods which are coming in or out. <coughs> um, platforms have been found. The circular platforms are famous in Harappa. Uh, but the exact purpose, again, is unknown. Initially, they were thought uh, to be used for husking grain uh, or you know, perhaps having a, a, a mortar here. But uh, this also has been questioned. Uh, where they could also have been used as platforms for dyeing cloth. Uh, again, these hypotheses have, are not fully answered. Now, we move to Kalimangan, which is a small city, uh, smaller, let us say. I think it's about uh, 12 to 13 hectares, if I remember well, um, on the Sarasvati River, or Gagar, as it is called, uh, in northern Rajasthan. And here you can see the same design as at Harappa, as far as the upper part of Kalimangan is concerned, uh, you can see the, 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 the uh, recessed entrance facing the riverbed in exactly the same way, and a kind of inclined parallelogram, exactly why were they not uh, having a rectangular, perfect rectangular shape is not clear. Uh, there is also the same angle here at work, even though the streets uh, within the lower city here at, are at uh, 90 degree angle. Uh, so we have an echo here of, uh, of Harappa, but together the two uh, are a good uh, repetition of Mohenjo-daro because we have this uh, dichotomy between an upper and a lower city. So obviously the rulers must have been somewhere in the upper city, but then there were other things which we cannot fully understand. For example, here huge platforms in the lower part of the upper city uh, no habitations. The habitations are in the upper part and in the middle, uh, uh, sorry, in the, in the lower city. Uh, what were these platforms were used? Well, all kinds of answers such as rituals, ceremonies have been proposed, but um, uh, these are again uh, hypotheses. Uh, this is one of the streets uh, in the lower town of Kalimangan, which I was showing you on the map. Uh, this is the, uh, the widest, and here, strangely, we see another desire to impose norms, standards, you know, some, some idea of planning. Uh, you can see that there are 
uh, minds at work who had a great love for order, who didn't like, who perhaps would not have liked the kind of chaos we see in our, some of our modern Indian cities, because here the streets were actually normalized, standardized to specific widths, which obviously are growing in multiples. You see 3.6, 5.4, 7.2 are multiples of 1.8, which is the, the narrowest. So uh, this is quite remarkable because you might say it is, it is not at all an indispensable feature, but, uh, but uh, these people obviously believed in imposing certain such norms. Kalimangan also is known for this uh, particular house, uh, which has, uh, 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 where we have uh, its owners uh, indulging in the luxury of having those flooring tiles. You see huge uh, floor tiles of terracotta with the typical Harappan design called uh, intersecting circles, which we will find on pottery and other uh, artifacts. And <clears throat> this, uh, this is also remarkable because obviously it is a, a superfluity of life. It is a kind of luxury. It's a sign of a certain economic affluence. And, uh, and those terracotta uh, tiles uh, were quite well uh, baked and uh, very, very well laid also. Otherwise, uh, they would have been broken by usage, but they are still in quite good condition. Uh, Banawali, there's not much to say. This is a site on the Sarasvati again. The Sarasvati flows here. Um, uh, it's a site which unfortunately has not been much excavated, only partly, um, uh, uh, but yet we find here a different kind of layout. So you see there are variations. The Acropolis is here, uh, this kind of uh, uh, semi-oval uh, shape. Uh, whereas the total city is some, somewhat squarish. So there are variations in the town planning. It's not as if the town planning is strictly uh, imposed in every case. But then there are enough features uh, from city to city which are quite recognizable, including the drainage system, but this I will come to uh, a little later. In Banawali, an interesting structure which the excavator, Dr. Aris Bisht, uh, um, uh, uh, suggested uh, was used for some kind of fire worship because within this altar here, uh, this, the, there was no room for habitation. You can see again the worker giving you the shape, the scale. And uh, this um, uh, semicircular altar was full of one foot thick of ashes. And just ashes, no, no bones for instance, which would have been the case if it had been used for cooking purposes. So, and then this, uh, you see this apsidal, as it is co called technically, that is to say semi-oval, this apsidal shape within an apsidal shape is uh, something quite intentional. This is made of uh, mud bricks. Uh, the, the whole building was made of mud bricks, only, of course, the lower layers uh, remain now. So we continue our brief uh, uh, travel through this civilization with Lothal which is actually, this is wrong. It is not exactly in Saurashtra, just uh, uh, on the border of it. It is south of uh, Ahmedabad. And <clears throat> this is a small site, but of great importance uh, because of its famous dockyard. I'll return to it in a moment. Uh, you have here uh, fortifications uh, and closing the city, and or the town rather. And this is the Acropolis, or upper part of it. Uh, and we can probably suspect that the rulers would have been living in this complex here. Uh, the, the rest is a lower town consisting of all kinds of habitations, small workshops, um, uh, various uh, manufacturing units. And, uh, but then uh, this is in fact an artistic uh, reconstruction of the, not exactly to scale, but um, uh, we can see this uh, dockyard where boats probably much smaller than this one because the whole dockyard measures something like 223 meters, uh, were coming to receive goods stored in this warehouse. So let me show you very briefly. Uh, this is another photo of the dockyard, 217 meters in length. Um, uh, uh, even today, it can still store uh, uh, water after the monsoon. And uh, its walls were made of the fire bricks, baked bricks of high quality, though they are uh, disint disintegrating fast nowadays. And the, the whole town was on, on this side of the dockyard. 
Um, uh, the dockyard that was identified as a dockyard, there was some controversy. Was it really a dockyard for boats to come uh, from a tributary of the Sabarmati River uh, uh, all the way up here? Or was it a kind of uh, simply water storage facility? But in that case, such a huge reservoir for a, such a small settlement would not have made much sense. Uh, in fact, the, the point is that um, ma uh, marine organisms have been collected from, uh, uh, from the, the sediments at the bottom, and uh, therefore there is a, a proven contact with the sea, plus the fact that the walls are vertical. There is, if it is a water reservoir, as we'll see in Dholavira very soon, you would ex expect steps leading down so that you can go down to the water level as it uh, uh, recedes. This is not the case. And then spillways uh, here at both extremities, uh, which seem to indi indicate a control over the water level. So all these points together seem to, uh, to argue in favor of the dockyard. And then this is the warehouse just next to it with specific platform, uh, different platforms of uh, bricks, which, over which the goods would have been stored. And uh, this uh, design is perhaps both to increase ventilation uh, so that the goods will uh, be better preserved, as well as perhaps simply for ease of loading and unloading. So um, uh, uh, this is uh, not to be a warehouse because at some point it caught fire. It must have had, as most Harappan buildings, a superstructure of, of timber and uh, some kind of thatching. And um, uh, luckily for us, uh, during this fire, more than 60 uh, Harappan seal impressions, not the seal themselves, but impressions over lumps of clay, uh, were actually accidentally burnt, baked by this fire, and therefore well preserved. And um, these, uh, these would have been used to seal rooms within the, 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 the warehouse, or perhaps even uh, directly consignments, uh, bundles of goods being shipped away. Uh, this is a view of the street in the lower Lothal, uh, no, called by the excavator the Bazaar Street. And uh, now we move to one of the most important Harappan sites, Dolavira in the run of Kutch. This is in the highly seismic zone that Professor Matthews was showing. I think it is zone 5, if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, in fact, there is evidence uh, by about 2700 BC, the archaeologists who excavated this site, Dr. Aris Bisht, uh, we excavated from 1990 onward till about uh, 2003 or 4, uh, he found evidence of destruction by earthquake uh, at about uh, 2700 BC, after which the city was gradually uh, rebuilt and enlarged. So <clears throat> they <clears throat> did not abandon the site because of the earthquake but they actually improved upon it. And here we have not a, 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 a division into two parts, but a division into three parts. There is an upper city, middle, and lower. The upper is here in, in blue. Uh, there is a so-called castle, which is a heavily fortified area. <coughs> the, we will see, we'll see it a little better later. And a bailey with lots of habitations. Uh, the rulers, again, are, are probably... Uh, uh, residing in this so-called castle. Uh, it would make a lot of sense from an architectural point of view. And it's on a higher ground also. And then you have here the middle town with enclosing also a huge ceremonial ground of something like 285 meters in length, which is a flat ground with a plastered uh, 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 ground. It was a kind of a, a pink clay plaster which was applied all over it, and stairs on both sides, uh, uh, actually platforms creating stairs a little bit like this auditorium so that people could sit at different levels. So uh, what exactly was happening on this ground? Well, we can use our imagination, uh, some, uh, uh, some rituals, some uh, sports, or some games, or some uh, uh, marketing, uh, you know, melas, we don't really know. Uh, or perhaps all of them. The middle town had most of the habitations, and there were some more here in this part of the lower town. But all the rest of the city was used for water storage. I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. 
let me proceed with a few pictures of Dolavira. This is actually a reconstructed view of the castle seen from the northern side. Uh, this, uh, this would, it might have been something like that. Of course, the whole top of the fortification has gone, so this is just a conjectural reconstruction. Uh, but <clears throat> you can know the massiveness of these uh, walls. They reach a width of 19 meters of thickness, up to 19 meters in thickness, which would be uh, probably a little more than the, the, the width of this hall or something like this. So this is just the width of this hall. Why exactly such thick walls? If it was purely for defensive purposes, you don't need this kind of uh, thickness. It's not necessary. There can be many explanations, including possibly uh, the rulers having their residences right on top. Uh, because it would be much cooler exposed to the breeze than if they lived right in the middle. This is actually proposed by the excavator, Dr. Bish, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I forgot to say that the walls, these walls, these fortifications walls, uh, this is another view, uh, are actually have a core of mud bricks, but both sides will be built with massive stone. This is stonework uh, because there was a stone a uh, 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 quarry a few kilometers away from the, uh, in this island, on this island in the run of Kutch. And uh, uh, the stone constructions are not seen in Sin or Punjab because, as I said, there's no stone at all. But here, because it was available, uh, the Dholaviran engineers made the most of it, and most of the foundations were laid in stone. Uh, so we have, a, for the, the fortifications walls, we have a core of uh, mud bricks and two flanks of stonework, uh, which you can see here at the uh, northern gate of the castle. You can see the kind of massive uh, construction there. It's quite spectacular. There's no other Harappan site uh, that can give you uh, this kind of uh, 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 you know, massive construction, especially in stone. Uh, this, uh, the castle is there on the other side of this wall. So uh, the, you know, people would have been coming in and out uh, this way. And here in this, this is a sentinel, uh, sentinel room, which is uh, carved out of the thickness of the fortification wall. And in this particular sentinel wall, uh, room, sentinel room here, a huge inscription of uh, uh, about three meters length was found, consisting of ten signs, ten Harappan signs. You know the the famous Indus script, still undeciphered, or rather there's no agreement on, on a number of decipherments. Um, and uh, and uh, each letter is, is about 33 centimeters in uh, height, if I remember correctly. And uh, in fact, the dimension of this, uh, these, these were a kind of mineral uh, 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 material, which was embedded in a wooden plank. Now, the wooden plank has uh, disintegrated. There's almost no wooden remain at all in the entire Harappan civilization, unfortunately. And uh, this material remains, but then the dimensions suggest that it might have been, uh, this might have been a signboard hanging right over this northern gate of the castle. And this is very important because it's the only such inscription in, of, of this size in the entire Harappan world. All other inscriptions are tiny thing on, in the seals, or a few signs on pottery. Uh, and uh, therefore, it suggests that, you know, uh, this is the one old debate, how, how much of literacy was, re was there really in the Harappan world? Was the script uh, the property of a kind of elite? Uh, if this inscription was really hanging there for everyone to see, it suggests that at least some people were able to read uh, the Harappan script. So these are the kind of mysteries that remain. This is another sentinel wall within the eastern wall of the castle. And uh, you can see, again, uh, massive stonework. But you can also see uh, these pillar bases. These, are, these square forms are pillar uh, bases, highly polished and perfectly regular. This is a, 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 a feat of engineering in itself. And then you have what are now understood to be pillar segments. Uh, some of which are also lying here around, uh, which would have been piled up uh, over one another and, uh, and, uh, until they reached the roof. And this is a very interesting design because Dholavira gave us the answer to some of those uh, 
Ring stones also found in uh, Mohenjo-daro, but they were not understood in, Mo in the Mohenjo-daro context. In fact, it's now proven that the Mohenjo-daro ring stone actually come from Dolavira or the Kutch region, yes, because this is the area where they were mined. And um, so the, the, the usefulness from a structural point of view, in fact, we, we, we would need uh, the advice of experts here, but uh, the, there are, of course, many uh, advantages to such uh, design. One is that you can assemble pillars of various heights at your, uh, at your desire. Another is that, you know, uh, for transportation, it's much easier to transmo transport shorter segments than a huge monolithic uh, pillar. Uh, Professor Arun Ayanga, in fact, proposed another hypothesis, which we would have to study, which is that perhaps these would be more earthquake resistant than a monolithic pillar, because with lateral mo uh, a motion um, of the ground, um, a monolithic pillar might be apt to, to snap at a path, you know, beyond a certain intensity, whereas these segments would move relative to each other, but perhaps the pillar might not collapse. I think this would have to be you would have to do some modeling about this, Professor Thomas, and tell us whether this hypothesis can hold. These are some of the streets in the middle town of the Nolavira. You can see once again uh, this uh, concern with uh, planning, geometry, order, uh, streets at uh, n you know, neat uh, 90 degree angles, and these are all the habitations on, on, on both sides with stone foundations. But the actual building the actual houses would not have been built with stones. They would have been built with mud bricks in this region. Mohanjo-daro is almost entirely built with baked bricks, probably because of very high uh, water table in Mohanjo-daro due to the proximity of the Indus River. So uh, the, the Harappans there wanted to minimize uh, uh, infiltration of uh, dampness into their, their habitations, and therefore they used baked bricks. But here, this is an extremely arid climate. Even if it was slightly less arid, possibly in Harappan times, uh, they were not really bothered by such problems. And therefore, mud bricks were just as good uh, for habitation as fire bricks. This is another view, one huge complex uh, housing complex in the middle uh, uh, town. And uh, let us, in fact, have a few words quickly on construction techniques. Uh, this, I have already spoken of the Harappan bricks, and you can see some of them here at close-up. And <clears throat> you see, they have these modern proportions that our bricks today have. That is to say, uh, uh, the width is twice the height, and the length is twice the width. Now, they, they were so modern, in fact, that in 1914, one uh, scholar attached to the Archaeological Survey of India visited the site on the advice of uh, the director, uh, John Marshall. And uh, he saw those bricks uh, uh, there lying around, uh, but they did not conduct any very deep excavation. And he said, you know, judging by the bricks, the site could be two to 300 years old at the most, uh, because this is what the, the, the bricks were saying. So he could not, it's only seven years later, seven, eight years later, that uh, the correct age was understood. Now, the advantage of those bricks is very simple that you can, uh, as you can see here, when you have successive courses, you can have one course lengthwise and another widthwise. And if you want to have a very narrow wall, that will be quite enough. Just one brick widthwise will, will do. And this is known as, in masonry as the English bond, which I propose should be renamed the Harappan bond. But um, uh, you know, the English have a, a habit of claiming a lot of things anyhow. Um, uh, this uh, was assembled only with mud uh, mortar. Uh, there was no lime mortar there. Uh, but, uh, and of course, the bricks were not left exposed, as you can see them here. They were covered with mud plaster, which has long disappeared. So uh, this is one problem which archaeologists are facing, that uh, especially in Mohenjo-daro, how do you conserve such walls after leaving them now exposed to all the weathering taking place? And in fact, the Mohenjo-daro bricks are suffering a lot because they were never meant to be exposed like this you know, for decades together. Uh, they, they were protected by a mud plaster, which uh, unfortunately uh, we, we cannot recreate so easily. <clears throat> in fact, uh, I should have said briefly that you see these multiple layers. What looks like different layers are not different stories. 
you can see the difference in height. They are simply uh, 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 different levels of reconstruction of the cities as it gets flooded by the Indus. And when the Indus floods, it deposits huge amounts of sediments, which it has carried all the way from the Himalayas. So the, the Mohenjo-daro uh, 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 builders, strangely, rather than try to evacuate the um, uh, sediments every time, preferred to actually rebuild their, hab their habitations on higher and higher grounds. Uh, this is what this photo seems to say. This is a design of typical Harappan house with a central courtyard and rooms organized around it. And this is actually a design that will live on, uh, that uh, can still be found in many traditional uh, houses in uh, rural parts of India uh, because it's so convenient and well adapted to hot climates in particular. This is one photo of a very large uh, house, a single house in Mohenjo-daro, where you can see multiple rooms. But let me rather show you this plan, because one lady, Anna Sarsina, uh, an Italian scholar long ago, uh, did a meticulous study of all the house plans and found that actually there were five uh, types of them, and uh, basically not more. There could be variations, but basically there were five master plans for the houses, which were repeated on and on. And uh, these, <coughs> uh, the, she has classified and she has given the, the, the specific details for each of them. Uh, you could, you know, um, almost call them uh, uh, BHK1, BHK2, or something like that. It's not exactly the idea. It's not purely size, but uh, uh, this is how it works. The largest have this central uh, courtyard around which the, all the rooms are organized. So even in the types of housing, there is, somebody has kind of given a, a, a standard to be followed, uh, at least in Mohanjo-daro. Uh, this is quite remarkable. That means nothing much is left to chance. Uh, in fact, there is even a debate now as to whether this stupa, which dominates the Mohanjo-daro uh, Acropolis, here you see the great bath, which we will turn to in a moment. Uh, this stupa is, was all the way supposed to be a, a stupa, that is to say, a Buddhist monument over the Acropolis. But uh, now there is a new thinking uh, by a few scholars, including Mikhail Janssen, the German archaeologist who worked at Mohenjo-daro for uh, many years, that uh, this might be a Harappan construction after all. So uh, you see, there are lots of, uh, what I want to say is that there are lots of uh, unanswered questions and still a lot of room for exploration. These are some of the pillar segments uh, at Dolavira, which I was uh, showing you in the in a sentinel in situ in a sentinel room, but these are uh, carried uh, out of the site, and uh, you can see how pillars of various heights could easily be uh, uh, assembled, and you can see, of course, the diminishing diameter of the the, the pillars. So this is a very simple, efficient uh, uh, pillar design which uh, they were using at Dolavira. Uh, talking of construction, uh, we have to make a mention of what I think we could qualify as an invention, that is to say the Harappan the circular well. It's an invention because though it looks obvious enough at first sight, there's uh, nothing very obvious about it. Uh, this is at Mohenjo-daro, and as I said at Mohenjo-daro, the water table was very high. So one result of this is that you get massive underground infiltrations. And um, uh, there will be pressure on the structure of the well. And therefore, if you use plain rectangular bricks, what's going to happen is that the pressure is going to push some of the bricks inside, and then they will fall into the, the well. And little by little, your structure will be weakened, and everything will collapse. So the solution which the Harappans found, no doubt by long trial and error, was to use not rectangular bricks, but trapezoid bricks, as you can see here. And those trapezoid bricks clearly are going to lock together when the, the pressure of the infiltration comes. So this is, uh, you know, it looks so obvious and simple, but it's extremely smart. And um, even 2,000 years later, the Romans, who were excellent hydraulic engineers, uh, had not found a solution to this problem. And they were still building big wells, generally square in shape, which, you know, used to collapse, some of them would collapse inward from time to time and had to be rebuilt, therefore. So this is uh, where we can 
appreciate you know, the, the, the expertise, technical expertise of the Harappans. Uh, in fact, though some in the later, this is from much later, 2,000 years later, uh, in India, uh, some uh, uh, of these trapezoid wells still survive in the Ganges civilization, the dominant well becomes the well of terracotta uh, rings. And you can see here from uh, Rupnagar in uh, near Chandigarh, uh, this one is from uh, Mahabalipuram, so a very different uh, period and different, so uh, obviously it has come to us uh, in the south from the north. And uh, the advantage of the ring well is that, well, you know, of course, that ring wells can be built from the top. You know, the rings are going to, uh, once you have done a basic excavation, your rings are going to move down with the weight and you can keep adding to them from the top. So it's a very safe way to build a well. You can't do that with a brick well. A brick well has to be built from the bottom. You can't build it from the top. So that's, that's the difference. So the Harappans, uh, what they did was that, and this is from Kalimangan, they, of course, had a huge uh, 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 excavation around. They, they made a very big cavity, uh, which is a lot of work. If you consider that Mohanjo Daro has an estimated, had an estimated 700 cylindrical brick wells. And here what we see, and it's very interesting, is that they built from the bottom, as I said, uh, which with a high water table must have created a lot of difficulties. We, we, we're not really sure how they did it. But then they also, uh, before closing you know, this uh, huge excavation, filling, filling it back with mud, they uh, created these buttressing, supporting walls uh, so that the structure would be very solid. So they had a certain sense of, you know, uh, uh, the strength and weakness of structures. Sanitation is a hallmark of uh, the Harappan civilization on a much wider scale than uh, in uh, contemporary cities, again, in, in, in for, like uh, Egypt or Mesopotamia. And interestingly, it comes actually from the, it is visible in a few sites, uh, even before the phase of urbanization, which, as I mentioned, begins about 2600 BC. This is about 200 years earlier in Kalimangan, where we can already see a neatly uh, 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 lin, uh, uh, straight street with some drains of baked bricks running alongside. So this is even before the urban phase. So we can see that some of these inputs must have, must have matured uh, much earlier. And uh, well, typical view of the so-called municipal drains of Monjodaro. You have individual bathrooms in these houses here, beyond this wall on the left, and you can see all the individual drains taking the dirty waters out of these bathrooms and joining into the municipal, what I call municipal uh, drain here. This would all be common. This is a street, and all of it would be, of course, covered. This would be underground, you see. Uh, it has been excavated now so that we can see it. And uh, there would be openings, kind of manhole covers or uh, uh, slabs at regular intervals uh, because, you see, uh, it's very nice to have a drain, but if you don't have a force to maintain it regularly and clean it, it's going to be clogged in no time at all. So Harappans were aware of this, and, uh, the, which is why we can uh, say that there was some kind of a municipal force uh, to maintain the, the, the drains. And, uh, but then what's remarkable from an engineering point of view is that uh, Mikhail Janssen, this German archaeologist whom I mentioned earlier, has measured the slopes of the drains and he found that they are one to two centimeters per meter, more or less all over the city. So this means a tremendous amount of calculation, planning to make sure that you know, the initial levels and the lower levels are going to allow this kind of a slope. If you visit my city of Coimbatore, you know, any substantial rainfall will cause all the drains to overflow because they don't have a slope. So you see these are, these are problems which we are still uh, grappling with millennia later. Uh, a quick view of how it would work within a house. This is actually one house here. And you have a private well. Some of the wells in Mohanjodaro were private, some were public. And uh, you have the bathroom here. So by bathroom, of course, we should not picture some of our luxurious bathrooms. These are modest bathing platforms. But still, every, almost every house in Mohanjodaro and Harappa had such bathing platforms. 
And this, this in, inner drain, internal drain, takes the dirty waters below the boundary wall. And you can see the very nicely adjusted curve with all this is made of bay bricks. And you can see here a sump, you see. So that the, the, what, the purpose of the sump is obvious. It is meant to allow the, any solid matter to drop down there. And for, for, for maintenance of the drain, because here this is a lane, this is a public lane, uh, then it's going to be much easier. So you can see the amount of thinking that it, it takes and to ensure, again, the proper levels and, you know, so that the, the water can flow. Um, a quick view of one a typical uh, a large house of Mohenjo-daro. I'm showing it only for one purpose because it happened to have a pipe of terracotta, segments of terracotta assembled together, vertically embedded in a wall. But this is amazing and totally unexpected because it shows that there was some you know, water activity going on on the first floor. Um, uh, and it must have been probably a bathroom. So the, the conclusion would be that the owners of this house probably lived on the first floor, which is advantageous because uh, it would mean a, a lot less dust and noise. Uh, you know, the streets in Manjaro were not paved. They were, they were just covered with mud. So the, the whole city would have been pretty dusty. And probably the servants would have worked in the ground floor. Uh, more such uh, slides, I can move a little faster. This is from Lothal, uh, where you have a series of 12, we see only a few, 12 bathing platforms connected to this perfectly uh, straight, uh, 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 nicely constructed drain uh, made of uh, big bricks. Uh, these are more drains in the lower town, taking probably the flood waters uh, uh, away from the... And then, then the latrines. Latrines have not been, were not studied much in earlier phases, but recently in Harappa there's been a whole study of latrines, and they were found to consist mostly of a kind of a commode, uh, which uh, these are the foundations of the commode here, uh, where people sat. And uh, uh, there was a, a soak jar here to receive everything, and then... A, a, a water pot for washing. So, but then you please consider that this was available in almost every house. So this shows the degree of uh, importance that Harappans attached to, uh, to hygiene and to a certain sense of order. Water management is one, perhaps my last, uh, uh, last but one area I, want, I would like to cover. Can I have another 10 minutes? Uh, this is about uh, very early structures, some of which uh, are found in Harappan times. We cannot, strictly speaking, call them Harappan. They are from Baluchistan at that time. They are called Gavar Bans. Uh, they have a very long history afterwards. And uh, these are uh, so ingenious that I could not resist showing them. Uh, you simply have a stream there flowing down from the Baluchistan hills. And to, to do agriculture for good, efficient agriculture, what you simply do is to terrace a side of the stream and make it fairly horizontal, but then in a way that you know, the, the water will gently invade your field. Now, it means you know, these must be very lazy farmers, but very smart also, because the water is going to, of course, irrigate, plus the stream is going to drop its sediments and therefore fertilize the, the field automatically. So these are very efficient, uh, low-cost uh, uh, water structures uh, from the, the... But you need a good slope and, of course, a good stream. Now, back to Mohenjo-daro with the great bath. We have a better view now of this basin, which is about uh, 12 meters by 7. And you can see, again, the very nice brickwork. Uh, these are all pillar bases. Uh, the whole structure might have had, again, a super uh, structure of... Uh, uh, wooden beams. And here we have uh, some 12, if I rem remember well, uh, individual cells uh, where perhaps, well, these are assumptions again, uh, just hypothesis, perhaps uh, priests or people conducting rituals uh, would have, be, uh, you know, changed. Uh, there is a well also which would have been used both for filling the tank as well as for ablutions, uh, etc. So the exact purpose of the gray bath remains a little bit debated. Initially, it was thought that uh, uh, this was a public bath. But then when archaeologists fi started finding individual bathrooms in almost every house, they realized that there was no need of a public bath. And therefore, this is thought rather to
to be uh, uh, for ritual purpose, you know, some kind of uh, religious uh, uh, ablutions taking place there. This is a plan of it, published by John Marshall. You can see the entire complex. Uh, we were standing in the earlier uh, photo, we were standing somewhere here. And uh, you can see that uh, this is the well filling which was, would have been used to fill the uh, basin. But then how to empty it? Well, it had a, a drain, a huge, uh, in fact, underground drain uh, go, going out uh, to in the north, uh, southwest corner. And uh, this means there must have been some kind of a small sluice or some system to, you know, uh, to close the, this drain. This is the, uh, uh, the outcome, outlet of the drain a little further down. And uh, you can see, in fact, here a better view of it. Uh, this is the, the drain. And you can see that this is what is called technically a corbelled drain. Corbelled because you have different levels of bricks uh, uh, till they join. Now, I'm just making a small reflection here from an engineering point of view, which is that uh, I always wonder why the Harappans did not invent the true arch. Because actually they had it. This is nothing but the principle of the arch, but it was horizontal. They never, it never occurred to them you know, to flip it vertically and use true arches vertically, where instead they use corbel arches. To my knowledge, the earliest true arches in India date back to the first or second century AD. Uh, they are to, you can see them in Koshambi, for example, in, uh, uh, on the Yamuna. Uh, but uh, the Harappans did not know the true arch. Few words on uh, water management at Doravira. Uh, uh, I showed you the plan, but I forgot to mention that the, the, the whole city was bracketed, you might have noticed, by two little streams. Uh, these are actually small seasonal streams. You can see the bed of one of them here. And uh, the, the intention is quite deliberate and obvious. It is to divert some of the water from those streams right into the city in those reservoirs I mentioned. And this is done by constructing a series of dams. You can see here the remains of one of these dams on one of these uh, channels or nallas, if you prefer, uh, which would be filled only seasonally. They would be dry most of the year. Today, if you visit, uh, you will find them carrying water only during the monsoon. So this is one possible way to uh, use these uh, uh, stone structures on each side and close them with series of... Uh, uh, what is called a palisade. Uh, there could be other designs too. We, we cannot be sure. And ultimately, uh, this is how the city might have looked like uh, during a bountiful monsoon, where this is, uh, uh, these are the two streams, you see, which are bracketing the city, and uh, the, whose waters are brought into the city. And there are, uh, there's a series of reservoirs are here, plus a, a number of a man-made reservoirs, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. This is another view, of course, uh, computer generated. And uh, we know that there are many wa important water structures within Dolavira. These are tanks uh, in the castle area, which therefore would have been used possibly exclusively by the rulers. Uh, what's interesting here is that all of these are connected by underground uh, uh, drains. Uh, there is a wide network crisscrossing uh, the, uh, uh, the castle, uh, bringing water harvested from various parts of the castle into these tanks. So water harvesting is done in a big way. Uh, there is uh, also in the castle this uh, huge stone well here, and uh, it's about six meters in diameter. And, well, this is not at all the well of trapezoid bricks. Uh, and it, is, it would be susceptible to inward collapse, but since we are in a very dry region, there's no such fear. The, the underground infiltrations are going to be weak at all times, and this is why the well survived for hundreds of years. Uh, this is from the top of the fortifications, the castle fortifications, where we can see here a strange, uh, uh, highly polished, uh, 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 big stone slab, and actually, it is part of a structure which is meant to channel whatever rainfall would hit the top of the uh, fortification walls, channel it into a kind of funnel shape all the way into those underground drains which I just mentioned. So very uh, uh, sophisticated 
uh, thinking, planning, and execution to make sure that basically not a drop of water is wasted. Uh, this is a view of one of the uh, underground uh, stormwater drains in the castle. You can see that uh, uh, this is another one. This is actually Dr. R.S. Bisht who excavated uh, the site in the 1990s. You, this lady gives you the scale of the drain, all built with massive stone, big, big stone slab covering it all. And you wonder because, in fact, <laughs> this is going to be empty most of the time. So what message this gives us is actually a climatic message. It tells us that the Harappans were expecting massive rains once in a while. You see, especially, of course, during the monsoon, but possibly uh, at other times. And they didn't want to waste any of it. So therefore, they built those uh, enormous drains, uh, even though the average rainfall is extremely scanty. So it's not a question of average, but it's a question of capturing the peak rainfall. Uh, this is uh, in another part of, um, of uh, Dolavira, uh, 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 one such underground uh, drains, which you can notice simply by the top covering slabs, and this manhole cover. So this manhole allows somebody to, to go into and clean whatever needs to be cleaned. Now, apart from the uh, sequence of reservoirs I showed in the earliest plan, uh, there were some man-made reservoirs very close to the castle. And uh, this is the colossal eastern reservoir. You can see the dimensions here for yourself. It's enormous, almost as long as a football ground, and uh, something like uh, 20,000 cubic meters uh, at its peak. There are three uh, stair stairways leading down into it. You can see two of them here. And in addition, there is a curious uh, structure known as a step well. Uh, uh, at the bottom of it, this is it here, but you can't see it today anymore. It's partly covered, uh, which uh, is intriguing. Was it uh, made at the same time as the tank, in which case it would be a kind of an extension of the, of the tank, of the reservoir? Or is it a slightly later structure? Is hard to say. But uh, this is one, possibly the earliest step well in India, of course, uh, of simple architecture. This is a reservoir carved in stone. And you can see the amount of work this would represent. It's 33 meters long. It's actually a double reservoir. There's a secondary reservoir uh, 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 within it. And I'll come back to it in a minute. And um, these, all these reservoirs, again, are interconnected with underground drains. The advantage of it, obviously, is that if for any reason one reservoir happens, happens to be full or even to overflow, it can pass on this excess of water to the others. So it's a chain of reservoirs, strictly speaking. So you can see that there's a considerable amount of thought given to how to make this city in the run of Kutch, which today has no city whatsoever, livable through the year, you know, when, when you, you might have no rainfall apart from the the monsoon. And uh, well, they, they tackled the problem, and the city uh, stood for something like six to seven hundred years. So they were able to really adapt to this uh, difficult environment uh, successfully. Finally, a few quick uh, words at metrology and proportions, which, strictly speaking, are part of civil engineering. Uh, I'll not say much about the series of uh, weights uh, that the Harappans were using. This is for uh, trade. Uh, control of uh, goods and so on. Uh, it followed uh, two systems. The first way, starting from 0.86 grams, followed a geometrical progression. You see, every successive weight was twice as heavy as the preceding one. But then, instead of continuing this series, the Arabians switched to multiples, you know, 10 times, 100 times, or 1,000 times the previous uh, uh, weights for some reason. We don't really know why. So this means that also they were, they were familiar with you know, the concept of multiplying by 10 or 100 or 1,000. But more important to us today are some uh, uh, concepts of uh, proportions which I want to, to expand upon. But before I do that, I want to show you this curious object from Lothal. I don't know whether they've been found at other sites, uh, which, uh, the purpose of which was unknown initially. It's made of shell. And this actually, it turns out to have been a compass. This is a system by which Harappans were measuring angles. And every slot is exactly 45 
degrees removed from the previous one. So you can lay this uh, on a flat surface and you can actually take alignments uh, with a high degree of precision. So this is one of the tools they were using. They were, must have been using a lot of uh, wooden tools, but we don't have those. Now, about proportions, back to the Mohanjal Daro Acropolis, and I'll just take a few, five, five minutes to conclude. Um, there's something peculiar about Harappan town planning, which I've not touched upon. It is not only a sense of order, geometry, etc., but also a sense of proportion. The um, upper city of, Dor of uh, uh, Mohanjal Daro here is about twice as long as it is wide. So uh, that doesn't, you know, that is not very impressive. But when you start looking at the other structures in this Acropolis, you find that all of them obey strict ratios and precise. And there's a very, very low margin of error on each of these ratios. Uh, so therefore, there is a, here a, a kind of a desire to implement uh, some sense of order, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, even individual buildings, like this one from the lower town, has a, exactly a proportion of 5 to 4. You will see that this 5 to 4 or 1.25 ratio is particularly important. And uh, this is, in fact, reproduced in the uh, so-called granary of Harappa. You can see the kind of ratio we get. Uh, there's uh, almost no deviation from 5 to 4. So why exactly were they doing that? What's the idea? Uh, uh, it's very difficult to answer, but there is obviously a sense of you know, uh, um, auspiciousness. Some, some proportion is considered to be more auspicious or perhaps more beautiful than another, rather than leave things to chance. You know, somebody who designs, for example, this auditorium is not going to be bothered about you know, the ratio between length and width. But the Harappans were really bothered. And it goes on like this. Lothal also has 5 to 4. If you take the middle point here quite precisely, the dockyard is exactly 6 to 1, and uh, etc. And um, Dholavira is the most striking of all because it has 5 to 4 exactly for the castle. It has very, very precisely 5 to 4 over the entire city. The margin of error is 0.01%. For the overall city, and that's 771 meters in length. So why were they doing this? You know, it takes a lot of labor, additional labor, additional effort, which actually has no utilitarian purpose. It doesn't make any difference whether you, you have this ratio or something else in actual practice. Uh, then the you have also exactly nine to four repeated twice between the, the length of the uh, uh, the, the castle and that of the middle town, and once again, 9 to 4 to the, uh, uh, the uh, outer city. 6 to 1 is for the ceremonial ground, the same ratio we saw at the dockyard of Lothal. So you can begin at 7 to 6 for the middle town. We can begin to see something going on, and it continues even for the reservoirs. There also they did not believe you know, to, uh, in uh, leaving things to chance, they wanted to impose strict ratios. So this is exactly 5 to 2. And uh, here we have also ratios of 7 to 2, 11 to 4, etc. So I, I did a little study, in fact. I published a few papers on this, where I showed that every major structure uh, on Earth so far obeyed one of these ratios. And you could be falling between some of these simple fractions, but you do not. You are always right on a simple fraction. So there is a philosophy here behind. Uh, is it exactly something similar to uh, the later concepts of, uh, I insist on the word later, of uh, Vastu Shastra? Some people rush to say that Harappans were following Vastu Shastra. No, I don't think we can make such a claim. But it is true that in Vastu Shastra, uh, you have this concept of proportions given. For example, Varaha Mira says that uh, the quarters of the king, uh, the, the length should be equal to the width plus one-fourth of the width. Now, width plus one-fourth of the width means that the, the length is exactly 1.25, one and a quarter. So that's 5 to 4. That's the ratio 5 to 4, which we have found here. And uh, you see, in, 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 it's there in many traditions of uh, India. For example, the, the builder of the Janta Mantar observatories, you know, Jai Singh, the Maharaja Jai Singh, his title was Sawai Jai Singh. What does Sawai mean? It means exactly one and a quarter. 
So this transition is, you know, a, a notion of increase. You add a quarter because it's considered a sign of growth, perhaps expansion. And um, finally, finally, I played around with the numbers and uh, calculated what could be the likeliest unit of length that uh, the Harappans used to design uh, Dolavira, and I found that uh, the unit of 1.9 meter uh, gave uh, beautiful numbers all around, but this is a detail we can leave it for the time being. Um, I think I will just skip those details, uh, except that um, uh, these are the ratios for all the reservoirs, and I found that my unit, even at short distances, small, short length of reservoirs, was giving uh, uh, almost perfect results. So anyway, let me, let me skip those details. They are uh, rather secondary. The point is that uh, we find a sense of order and a, a, a systematic use of proportions and possibly linear units in the Harappan world. Even small units like this angular, but I will uh, leave these details to, uh, for your later study. It doesn't matter much for today. Uh, I want to conclude on a remark that uh, this uh, standardization on town planning, as I showed, it's not a rigorous standardization, not that all sites follow exactly the same plan, but the concepts are shared between all the sites without doubt. Uh, a certain standardization of sanitation, of construction techniques, for example, the brick proportions are all over the, the sites identically. So this means that there must have been, either there was an almighty emperor who imposed all these standards, and it seems quite unfeasible with the area of one million square kilometers, or rather, and this is the present thinking of many archaeologists, there must have been communities, communities of builders, communities of town planners, <coughs> people we might call architects today, just as there were, of, of course, obviously communities of potters, of seal makers, of craftsmen, and uh, therefore this might be the mechanism by which these concepts and standards were shared, allowing some variations regionally, but nevertheless uh, very efficiently and remarkably shared over the entire region, which is how we can identify those sites are sharing one common uh, culture. So in the end, in the end, uh, this is what Gordon Child, the famous Australian archaeologist, wrote in 1952 after decades of explorations um, uh, in a book called New Light on the Most Ancient East. And he said, India confronts Egypt and Babylonia by the third millennium BC, of course, with a thoroughly individual and independent civilization of her own, technically the peer of the rest. Though, though again, Harappans had no uh, pyramids, they had no uh, glorious uh, monumental temples, etc. <clears throat> and plainly, it is deeply rooted in Indian soil. The Indus civilization represents a very perfect adjustment of human life to a specific environment, and it has endured. It is already specifically Indian and forms the basis of modern Indian culture. So this is just a quick uh, overview of uh, uh, Harappan uh, genius uh, in the area of civil engineering. I mean, many uh, more contributions of theirs could be highlighted in other fields, but uh, I think uh, this is uh, good enough for a start. Uh, as I said, many questions remain unanswered, and uh, there is still a lot of room for uh, future archaeologists to work on and a lot of sites for them to work on. Thank you very much. No, what I wanted to know was, did, was it jointed with a, with a particular material? Were the joints filled with the material? I do or not did it slip know. one into the other? I think like they slip into one, one another. Into the other. I think so, because I remember seeing in Dolavira the mouth of some, of course, I cannot swear that this is the case in Mohenjo Daro, yeah. but of some of these terracotta pipes was broader. So obviously, they were meant to fit right. into each other. Right. And the other question I had was on the reservoirs. Uh, was, the, was the bottom of the reservoir as well lined with some material that uh, prevented percolation? Uh, no, apparently not. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the largest reservoir in Dholavira, the bottom has not been reached, in fact. So they, they're not very sure, they're not excavated right to the lowest possible depth. Okay. Um, of course, in the case of the rock cut yeah, reservoir, but, then of course there's no question, yeah, the, yeah. The, the bottom is rock. Okay. But it's quite likely that the, the, uh, the earth mud reservoirs, if you like, 
uh, the bottom was not particularly lined, and it was allowing there for percolation. Okay. And uh, well, if if you have a well in this reservoir, then it makes sense because you'll be recovering that water later on. If your reservoir ever becomes empty, yeah, you still have this well to draw water from. Would and this be. design was repeated in the historical era, much much later in the Ganges Valley. There are sites like uh, uh, Sringaverapura on the Ganges, where there are chains of reservoirs, and each reservoir has a well at the bottom. Yeah. So perhaps the idea comes, I, I, that okay. of course we cannot. And were these reservoirs of, uh, I mean, a sort of a diminishing size mm -hmm. so they could collect water and... Uh... Uh, here in Dhoravira, not particularly. There is no such regularity. Um, they were just uh, adjusting themselves to rock surfaces which were there. Okay. So we, we cannot say that there was any particular such okay. order. And the, the, the eastern one was massive. On the southern one, there was a row of five or six reservoirs, possibly a few more may lie yeah. unexcavated, uh, but there's no such uh, sense of sequence. And my very last question is, the mounds that you mentioned of mud bricks, uh, uh, on which the settlements were raised so that you, to prevent from flooding of the settlements, were the mud, uh, I mean, was the mud reinforced or anything so that it would uh, uh, sort of withstand uh, flood waters? Um, you mean in Mahajwala Row, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, not, the mud, not the in mud bricks. Not in but in Harappa, I think you mentioned yes. the mounds of yes. mud bricks. Yes, Mahanjogara and Harappa face the same situation, yeah. in fact. And uh, yeah, these mud bricks were actually sun-dried bricks. You see, when we say mud bricks, we shouldn't figure that they were very malleable, not like that. They were hard, but not as hard as the fire bricks. Mm -hmm. But they could be good enough, uh, uh, especially if you are going to raise an entire platform, it would be extremely wasteful to do it yeah. with fire bricks there will be a certain structural strength of its own. So then mud bricks will do. But then when you build a house, you don't want to see it you know, melting away due to, uh, not only due to flood waters, but also due to the, the, the dampness that is going to be Rise. rising through the capillarity of the, of the bricks. Right. Here. Thank you, sir. Next. Here, here. Sir, uh, did you find a uh, no, uh, difference in uh, characteristics of the clay all over the area? And can you just uh, throw light on that? Excuse so me, the in type the, of the soil you know, in the, of the area, type of the soil you know, around this big area, how it was different from place to place, one. And um, uh, this, uh, how about the strength of this you know, bricks? Was it changing from place to place for used to use anything, any ideas on that? Okay, well, the, the second question, I'm not aware of any good, uh, uh, you know, mechanical uh, test done on the Harappan bricks. Uh, they were found to be of high quality, that is all we can loosely say. Uh, but I don't think any systematic comparison on the quality of bricks uh, has been made. Uh, of course, in the case of Monjodaro, Harappa, uh, Haryana also, these, you see, these are all alluvial plains. So you get fairly good quality uh, clay material. So what do you mean by call good quality clay? What do you mean by that? Uh, well, uh, which is deposited by the, those rivers. So if you if you see, no, for example, if you, you, know, if you travel in those regions even today, even today, for example, Ganges Valley is full of brick making factories, full of them. So they just use the alluvium. Which is which has a certain content of clay and silt, both. Oh, silt, that's all. Both, both, both. But I'm not aware, to be honest, of any systematic. We need engineering studies on all these aspects, absolutely. Uh, these were great alluvial plains, and that is the kind of uh, soil environment uh, they had. Uh, uh, a site like Dhoravira is totally different because it's on a rocky island in the run of Kutch. So the geology is totally different. There's nothing to do. So both the fire bricks and sun dried bricks, both are used there? Yes. OK. Next question. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 One minute, sir. <coughs> the dimensions which you have indicated, does it have any relation to, relationship to gudge, which is three feet? When you, when you multiply most of the dimensions, it is, a, is a equivalent to three feet, multiples of three feet. Is there anything connected like that? Have you found out anything like that? Uh, no, not exactly. You see, I, I didn't want to spend too much time on the question of the linear units. Uh, I personally found a unit of 1.9 meters at work in Dholavira, but that has to be confirmed.
come through statistical studies. It's maybe six hope, feet. It's maybe six feet. Uh, it is a little more than six feet. It's 1.9 meters. Six feet would be 1.81 yeah. meters. So maybe there is something, but um, uh, I find that actually the basic unit would not be the foot, but a unit around 21 centimeters. And uh, there's been, in the, if you look at the old excavation reports, there's been a lot of talk about an Indus inch and an Indus foot. But actually, there's been no real uh, study trying to correlate most of the Harappan dimensions, real dimensions, to those units. It doesn't seem to work very well. So we're still at the beginning from that point of view. Second. And it could be that there were many units, because see, in ancient Egypt, for example, there were at least a dozen linear units at length. Even if you take the cubit, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, there were at least two cubits in ancient Egypt. So there can be several systems at work at the same time. It can be quite complex. So we, we would have to really make a systematic study. The second question is this. Uh, the structures with all the floods you said, they are all maintaining, being maintained well, being kept well. Is it because that the mortar they have used is very strong? Or uh, the bricks themselves are, even though sun dried, is very strong. No, I think it's more because of, of the bricks, quality of the bricks, number one, but mostly this mechanical bond which the proportion of these bricks allow you to, to have. Uh, in the Ganges Valley, 2,000 years later, this proportion of one to two to four is abandoned for some reason. They, they, they don't use it anymore. And if you visit any of the uh, Gangetic sites, you will see like Nalanda, Koshambi, any of these, you will see much more squarish bricks and flat. They don't follow the Harappan proportions or, the, or our modern proportions at all. So the, these uh, proportions that the Harappans were using gave great structural strength to their walls with a minimum of material. You see, that's the, the, the advantage of it. So I think these are the two reasons. The, the mortar was just mud mortar. It would not have great strength of it on its own. But generally, the bond it gives you strength and a compressive strength in the top, from the top. But what about the side erosion and side push by the river? See, they would, have been, they would have been damaged. And we have actually evidence of damage due to flooding uh, from time to time in, in Dholavira. Lothal was destroyed by floods completely once. Archaeologists can trace these things fairly reliably. So it's not that everything was you know, hunky-dory and, uh, and structures were perfect and lasted forever, not at all. But they were always willing to, you know, reconstruct. And uh, sometimes even when there was a catastrophe, they would, it would signal a new phase of expansion. So that was the dynamism of the, of the civilization, if you like. But uh, structures were certainly vulnerable to, to, to the, the environmental conditions. There's no doubt about it, including Thank earthquakes. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Yeah. Now, what, what is the cause for the Mojar and Harappa become the center of the civilization in those days. Excuse me, what is the cause? What is the reason why it has been developed as the center of civilization? Uh, I have not understood. Some why things are there. What made it to become like that? <laughs> well, you could answer by simply saying, why not? <laughs> you see, if there is a convergence. There is a long evolution in this entire Northwest region for thousands of years earlier right from Neolithic times, and at a number of sites, well, not too many, but some in Baluchistan and one or two in Haryana, uh, cultures going back many thousands of years have been identified. And with the continuous evolution towards the, so those cultures were actually Neolithic, they were even in pre-metal ages, with just stone technologies. And we see gradual evolution, and, and it's, what is very important is that there's a building up of networks of trade right from Neolithic times, that means 7,000 BC. You find, you know, like for example, Mehergar in Baluchistan uh, has uh, shell artifacts, artifacts made of shell, which are found 100 kilometers away on, on the seashore, of course. So these networks are what, you know, bring people together, these, these trade activities. And, uh, well, cultures keep evolving, and, uh, and uh, then metallurgy comes in. It's a whole new technology which allows for rapid expansion. Uh, then agriculture is developed. With agriculture, you have a, 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 you know, a surplus of food at some point, which is a critical condition for cities to be established. So exactly why does it happen at a certain time, nobody can really say. There is a, probably a kind of critical mass that has to be 
crossed for cities to, to emerge. In the Ganges Valley, it will happen only in the first millennium city, so 2,000 years later. So there also, why? You know, you have to, to it's only by understanding the entire evolution of, of regional cultures that you can answer, but even though, even then partly, even then partly. We, there are many things which are still uh, unknown in our knowledge, uh, to our knowledge. Last question. Yep. What caused the end of the civilization? Is that what you're asking? Uh, uh, very brief answer. There is a multiplicity of factors at work. Um, long ago, there were theories that, you know, invaders came and destroyed these cities, and you find that still in some of our textbooks. But the simple fact is that archaeologists have never found the slightest bit of evidence to support that. So they've abandoned this theory. Instead, they concentrate on environmental uh, uh, problems. The, w there are two especially, but there could be a multiplicity of uh, environmental factors. One is that all over the world, uh, or much of the world, in from 2000, uh, 2200 BC onward, there is a considerable drought happening. It is felt in Mesopotamia, it's felt in Northern Africa, it's felt in Northern America also, even in China. And this is a 200 year long drought. Of course, there must have been rains from time to time, but it's suddenly grow, uh, severe aridity setting in. And this has altered patterns of agriculture over much of these regions. So this could be one reason, because cities are heavily dependent on agricultural surplus, right? So uh, uh, if that disappears, you see cities may have to be abandoned. Um, then there is another factor, which is this Saraswati River I showed you in the first map. Uh, which was certainly supplying water either directly through its main channel or through a multiplicity of side channels to some 360 sites in this region. And it seems to have dried up about 1900 BC. This is the evidence from a number of archaeological sites like uh, Kalimangan, for example, is totally abandoned. Uh, it was right on the Saraswati. It's abandoned overnight, not exactly overnight, but you know, maybe in the span of a generation or two, uh, around 1900 BC, we have radiocarbon dates. So uh, in that case, it means that the, the and, and, and this, if you map the evolution, I have that uh, in another presentation, uh, of the, the, the uh, settlement uh, patterns in this region, uh, beyond 1900 BC, all the, ba all the settlements in the central Saraswati Basin have disappeared, all of them, which means that the river has dried basically, at least in its central portion. So this would have been a very important factor. But you know, which factor took place before the other? Archaeologists also talk of social disturbances. They talk of disrupt, uh, uh, disruption of trade with Mesopotamia. All of these happened. But exactly in what order today, nobody can safely know. We'll take the last question. And if others have questions, please stay back and have a personal discussion with uh, Professor Danino. Last question. Yeah, madam, your last question. Please, Mike, please. Is there, any ev oh, <laughs> is there any evidence of human remains? Oh, yes, plenty. There have been, uh, uh, I'm not sure the total figures, but it runs into hundreds of skeletons collected from uh, various sites. Uh, in fact, most uh, sites, not Mohenjo-daro, but Harappa has two cemeteries, Dolavira has one, uh, Lothal has a small one, etc. Uh, every, almost every site has got a cemetery where some skeletons have been found. But you have to keep a few things in mind. First is that many of the graves have been found to be empty. For example, the Revira, 63 graves, only two have had a skeleton. All the other graves were just empty. So they were symbolic barriers. Um, uh, and secondly, even if you total up all the skeletons found in all the sites and you multiply by 10 assuming or even by 100 assuming that we've missed out a lot of skeletons and some have disappeared etc you still have a very very small proportion of the total population which would have inhabited all these cities over 700 years of the civilization so therefore the main means of disposal of the dead must have been cremation and not burial so that raises very important questions which we cannot answer again who were those who were buried and who were those who were cremated? You see, there might have been some social difference. Uh, these are two big questions. You know, we don't have enough evidence, strictly speaking.
uh, dear friends, at the end of this talk, I'm sure all of us will uh, share my view that uh, we'll be more, uh, even more proud as uh, Indians after seeing the accomplishment of the Harappans of uh, ancient times. And uh, spectacular town planning and building construction techniques that we saw leave us uh, quite astounded and it gives us, uh, makes us a uh, peep into the intellectual prowess and uh, achievements of the Harappan mind. I wish, uh, like a TV anchor, I could, uh, uh, you know, call in one of the old uh, Harappans to come here or download one of the Harappans and uh, make him sit here along with Professor Danino and ask him all the unanswered questions. Since uh, that is not possible, we should uh, wait for the, our archaeologists, younger archaeologists, to do more research and come up with the answers for uh, more, I think uh, you've raised more questions which are unanswered than answered, uh, including why uh, the civilization died. So uh, once again, on behalf of everybody present, present here, and personally, Professor, thank you for giving us a peep into our ancient uh, civilization. And I'm sure all of us uh, will carry wonderful memories uh, of this uh, talk and motivate us to read and uh, think more about what our ancients had achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Matthews. Uh, thank you, Professor Danino. Uh, I have the pleasure of proposing the vote of thanks. Uh, I think it was a fantastic journey uh, that took us about 5,000 years back in history. Uh, on behalf of the National Center for Safety of Heritage Structures and Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, uh, extend uh, my thanks to Professor Danino, who uh, almost immediately agreed to come here and deliver this lecture. He was in Gandhinagar conducting his course and uh, had to go back to Coimbatore yesterday to cast his vote and then come here uh, to deliver this lecture. So thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. Uh, as a token of appreciation, from the NCSHS and Department of Civil Engineering, I request Professor Matthews to hand over a small memento from IIT Madras. That's it. That's a, that's a unique uh, memento from IIT Madras from, from the campus. <laughs>